The first that I realized something was happening was when the first shot came out, and I thought it was a motorcycle backfiring. One had just passed by, and the Kennedys had just passed by 10 seconds before, perhaps. And then I heard a second and third shot, and I, I identified them as shots very definitely. But it was just, it was chaos immediately because nobody knew where the shots were coming from. Nobody knew what to do. They were throwing their children down, covering them. They were trying to run. Nobody knew where to run. And uh, it was just chaos immediately. Well, you don't, you don't manage. You don't, you don't think, you don't know what you're going to go through. It, it was it was invigorating. It was exciting. It was scary, and uh, it affected me more a day or two or three later, when I was quiet and I realized that I could have been shot at any time. I could, you know, I could have been run over. It uh, it, it came later. We never can forget, and each year we replay it. We wonder what happened. We wonder who, if anyone else was involved. Conspiracy theories have never been so popular. I wasn't assigned to the story and I felt badly, thought I ought to have been, everybody else was. And all morning long they were coming by, and my buddies and they were saying, hey, we go have coffee at the cafeteria. Well, I'm gonna be at the trademark. Well, I'm, I'm gonna be at Love Field. I'm, I'm in the motorcade. And I thought, you know, I'm, I'm sort of left out of this. Now, actually, I had the best beat on the paper. I was covering manned space flight. We, the Dallas News was one of the very few papers in the country that covered every, every flight through Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo. But still, I thought I should have been involved, you know. So I decided, President doesn't come to your town every day, so I'll just walk over there four blocks. Main Street, it was so crowded, seven, or eight, ten deep, some places. So I couldn't get close. So I walked around Houston Street on down, and it eased out a little bit by the depository building. And that's why I ended up in the middle of Elm Street with the window right up there. And uh, when, the, when the first shot came, I thought it was a motorcycle backfire because one had just passed me. But when the second and third shots came, I was very much aware there were shots, but I didn't know what to do. Well, as I said, everyone was, one woman regurgitated right behind me, another threw a child down and covered it. And, and I didn't have anything, I wasn't assigned to be there. And so I didn't have any paper, I didn't have a pencil. Imagine a, a reporter in that situation. So I look over and there's a little boy over here that has a big double pencil with a flag on it. I ran over and I grabbed it and I gave him two quarters and took it. And I reached in my pocket and I had two utility bills that I had mailed. So I had something to write on. And I started writing, started interviewing. And I saw this man with the hard hat and he kept saying, he's up there, he's up there. Well, I didn't know what he'd seen, and I looked up, there's nothing there now. But when he found out I was with the Dallas Morning News, he got panicky. He got two cops to physically pull me away from him, which was, was good for me, because then I started interviewing people over around the depository building, people who had been there, been in the, the doorway there, and all around it. So I interviewed several of them, and that was fortunate because I then heard a call a few minutes later, a call coming in from where an officer had been shot on a police radio on a motorcycle. In those days, you had to stay close to a police radio if you really wanted to keep up with any kind of activity that was going on. And I heard him say, the policeman had been shot and it's pretty bad gave the location and I thought, my God, that's only about three or four miles away. And it, somehow my brain 
it worked pretty good. And I thought, now if someone shoots at the president, of course we didn't know the extent at that time. Someone shoots at the president here, and three or four miles away, someone shoots a cop, could be involved, could be connected. But I was a long way. My car was four blocks away at the Dallas News. So I, I didn't know what I was going to do, but I had to get over there where the officer had been shot. Well, I found the two Channel 8 guys that had a motor unit. I said, did you hear what just came over the police radio? And they said, no, no, what? I told them, they said, get in. And we sped like mad for Oak Cliff in the scene where Officer Tippett had been shot. And it was really fortunate we got there fast. I interviewed probably six people there who had seen him shoot, who had seen him run from the scene, who had seen him throw shells away. And it was, it was a good few minutes. But still, we didn't know if it was connected. We didn't know where the shooter was. And, and I'll tell you a funny thing. People always say, well, weren't you scared to death? No, I wasn't scared to death, only once. It was, it was all happening too fast, and it was too damned important. But there was one time when I was scared. Over on, what's that name of that main street? Oh, can't even think. Getting old. Anyway, we, we had a, a store over there. It was a, a storage facility for furniture. And it was an old, dusty place. And the word was that Oswald was in there, or whoever was in there. We didn't know it was Oswald then. We go in there, I go in there with about six or eight cops, all of them. We run in there. Another cop comes from the back of the place. And this was an old, decrepit, dirty old storage house. This cop coming this way fell halfway through the ceiling. And he hollered, oh, and all the cops around me hollered, oh, and I looked around. Everyone had a gun but me. So I got out of there. That was the only time I was really, really scared. But then luck was with me again. I go out of that place, and there's a car, an FBI agent that I had known, and his radio was blaring, suspect in the Texas theater. Well, I didn't know Oak Cliff real well at that time, but I knew it was eight or 10 blocks away up Jefferson, that's the street, where the old bookstore or book place was. I ran like mad up there, and I was getting tired. You know, that was in the afternoon. I was getting a little tired. Drank too much coffee. Anyway, I get up there and I run into Julia Postal, who was the ticket lady. And I asked her the stupidest question that I probably ever ask anybody. I said, well, Miss Postal, did he buy a ticket? <laughs> well, her estimation of me, if it was ever anywhere, it went down. But she kept saying, he's in there, he's in there. So I go, I run in. There's two doors to your right as you go in that theater. And uh, I hit the door and I see open up, here comes cops, some uniform, some not, two or three on each each side, coming up toward the back. Oswald is about 15 feet from me, right over there in the second row. Well, they don't jump in first. They stop a couple other people, and then suddenly they, they come and get him. And I remember what he said as they jumped on him. He said it twice. He said, I protest this police brutality. I protest police brutality. And boy, they were brutal. They, they got him. He tried to kill one of the cops. Officer McDonald, the first one to him, he had a pistol in. He pulled it out. Tried to kill the cop. But somebody got their hand in the firing mechanism. Saved that policeman's life. But they got him out of there in a hurry. What I don't understand is that how, I guess everyone was listening to the radio. Because by the time we got outside with him, and I was real close to him, there must have been two or three hundred people out there in front of the Texas Theater. And later in the day, I went to his rooming house, 
and uh, there another conspiracy almost started. The woman told me he came in and got his jacket, and he left, and she saw him run to the left down Beckley Street. Later, she told all kinds of people that there was a police car came there, number 10, and it came there and picked him up and took him away. She made it up out of whole cloth just an hour after I had interviewed her. But it, it never stops. <laughs> and of course, what makes this year a little different, they just released or are releasing some new materials that they've held embargoed all these years. And I've looked through them, spent several days looking through them, and some were even pointed out to me by people in other countries that fashion all sorts of ideas about what really happened here. I didn't see anything in the new disclosures that changes anything. His trip to Mexico City, Oswald's, a month and a half, two months before the assassination, was the key to what's being held all this time. Some of it's been released. Some of it looks pretty bad for the way that the CIA and FBI particularly handled everything. And, and it's, it's sort of wild because we, we've known this all along. That trip to Mexico City, I think it was eight days, maybe nine days, he tried to get, Oswald tried to get back Visa back to Russia, where he had defected several years before. He also tried to get a visa to Cuba, either or. And he didn't have any success at all. They, they obviously didn't want him. Now, the new material that we see coming out slowly, and for goodness sakes, I hope it all comes out, and I think eventually it will. It doesn't change anything, but it just shows that the CIA and the FBI didn't do their jobs, or Mr. Kennedy would be alive, and probably Mr. Oswald too. They knew everything that he said, everything that he did during that visit, his several visits to the Russians and Cubans, because they had the places bugged. They knew what he said, and they knew that he did not make any kind of reference to kill Mr. Kennedy or anything else. He was trying to impress them, but that wasn't part of it. And I think eventually we're going to see that all going to be released. Because I think we, we have to release everything. And it won't look good. It doesn't look good to what's been released lately, particularly for the CIA, who actually lost him. They, they, they had all these bugs going, and they didn't know when he left Mexico City and came back to Texas. Now, in, in Dallas... An FBI agent named James Hosty had been assigned to interview Marina Oswald about her husband and her because they, they felt and they had word from some of their cohorts that, that he might be bringing Marina here to be an agent where she would relax and live a normal life for a year or two and become an agent. So they were very interested more so in Marina. Of course, they didn't know at that time that Oswald, a few months before, had tried to kill General Walker, had shot him and just missed by an inch or so. But anyway, James Hostie was the FBI agent. He had talked to Marina twice. He knew that Oswald worked at the depository building, but there was no word out of Mexico City from the Secret Service to anybody. The Dallas police, I recall chief police telling me, my God, if we'd have known he was on a parade route, we'd have sat on his lap. Because at that time, it was very rare for an American to defect to Russia. I'm not sure exactly, but I think we had eight or nine in all of history that had done that. And certainly none of them were allowed to come back with a wife. Russian, Russian wife. But it, it's more fun to believe in conspiracy, and that's why 
Oswald was a wannabe. I didn't know him. I got to know his family. I knew Marina. I got early interviews with her. I knew she lied at the first. Later, she was forced to, to come clean with what she knew. And she was the one that told him how he had shot at General Walker. But I'm sure that the Dallas police would have liked to known that the Russian defector was on the motorcade route. They just sat on his lap, I can assure you. They didn't know. Hosty, the FBI agent who knew we worked there, but didn't know anything else, had never talked to Oswald, was having lunch a few blocks away when he heard the news. So most of the stuff that is, has been embargoed is because they don't want to embarrass CIA and the FBI. And in those days, the CIA was doing some pretty nasty things all over Central and South America. And they tried to kill Castro several times, had an exploding cigar that didn't work, tried to poison him. They weren't too successful, but they did have a hand in the removal, as they put it, of several others in Latin and South America. I don't think that when everything else is released that you're going to find anything that's going to give you a second assassin or a reason or a fact that Oswald told people he was going to do it. Now, at this point, there are over 200 different conspiracy tales. Now, think about that for a minute. It's hard to know 200 people, isn't it? I was there that day that weekend and I'll never forget it and, and people won't let me forget it for one thing <laughs> sometimes I'd like to but it, it, it's the strangest thing we live in, a, in an era where so many people just want to be somebody they want to be noticed they want to be famous oh yeah and they want to make money too but it's just amazing. Here was here was a guy. I remember one time I wrote a, I, I I got a hold of his Russian diary that he'd done on the way back from Russia when he came home, and he spelled wrist R I S T, and I guess I shouldn't have written it, but I I said you know people say it, he's a CIA agent and this that and the other. How's that for a guy that can't see even spell wrist? Well, his mother, Mama Oswald, called me the next day. She was irate. She said, I'm going to insist that you correct that. I said, no, no correction needed. He couldn't spell wrist, you know. She said, well, your, your children will suffer and hung up. Well, I, I didn't have a tape recorder going up because it was a Sunday afternoon. I was watching pro football when she interrupted me. So I got a tape recorder and called her back. And uh, she said, oh, I, I, was, I didn't mean anything by that. In fact, she said, Hugh, we, I've got this deal going in Los Angeles. I'm going to talk to him out there. You could come with me, and we could go together. We make a lot of money. That's the kind of woman that she was. Last night, I, I was with a friend of mine, Bob Schieffer, whom you all remember. He still does a piece now and then, keeps his hand in, has a new book out. And Bob was a police reporter in Fort Worth at the time of the assassination. And he got he was just working his phones and didn't know anything in particular about any any of this. He gets a phone call and this woman says to him, Hey, I need a ride to Fort Worth. Will you come and get me? Bob Schieffer says, look, this is a newspaper. This isn't a taxi service. And she said, well, they've just arrested my son for shooting the president, and I, I need to get over there. Well, suddenly he became a taxi service. He got his car, and he drove Mrs. Oswald over. He said it was the most amazing thing. All she would talk about, she'd say, Marina's, everybody, everybody's going to know about Marina and send her money, and I'm not going to have anything. I'm not going to get anything out of this. 
that was the kind of mother he had. And later, as I got to know the other Oswalds, particularly Robert, who lives in Wichita Falls, Robert said, that's why Lee was Lee. He had to stay with his mother four years longer than I did. I got away and joined the Marines, got married, and I have a family, and Lee had to stay with her four years. And the last 25 years of her life, he didn't have anything to do with his mother. But it, it, was, a strange, it was a strange time. And it, the fact that I lucked into, uh, if you call it good luck or bad luck, all the things that happened was just just being a reporter. I wasn't even assigned to the to the visit. In fact, that morning I was having coffee up in the Dallas News, and who comes in? I'm sitting with the Channel Eight news director, and here comes Jack Ruby in. Now, Ruby always came around to the news and to the radio stations and particularly the Dallas News, he wanted them to put pictures of his strippers in the paper, and they seldom did it, but I said to the anchor guy, the news director, I said, oh God, act like we're busy so he won't come sit with us. Because he was just a nasty man, but he was a wannabe too. And Oswald couldn't keep a decent job. He'd had this job at the depository for a few days, but he couldn't keep a decent job, and and it was just he he was a wannabe though. He thought if he could get back to Russia, he could make up some stories and once again and be somebody. And they they watched him when he defected there because they thought he had served in in some areas where they had technology that the Russians needed to know about, and they thought maybe he could help them. I don't think that he did, but anyway. We live in that society now. <clears throat> Jim Hosty, the FBI agent I mentioned earlier, got involved in a situation that was really tremendous, tremendously bad for him. Oswald found out that, that Hosty had visited Marina in Irving where she was living with the Paines, and he went to the FBI office in early November and left a threatening note for James Hosty. He said, leave my wife alone or you'll be sorry. Well, after the assassination, it wasn't too, too, they weren't too happy to have that note. So the head of the FBI here called in Hosty and said, Jim, Jim, get rid of that note. Told him to flush it down the commode. So he burned it and then flushed it. And it, it didn't, some people wrote that the note said he was going to blow up the FBI, but that wasn't the case. It was just a threat, stay away from my life, my wife, or I'm coming back. But see, nobody knew all these things. And who knows what else came up in Mexico City that Oswald either talked about or trying to impress somebody with or whatever. But that's the kind of stuff that will still come out. And we know, I think another thing that keeps the people from releasing all the CIA stuff is we probably have some other nations that we were involved with that, that wouldn't look good if the facts of some of those years came out. Everybody wonders what the motivation of Oswald was. He just wanted to be somebody. Even Marina admitted that. She said he was always talking about how he'd be famous someday. And she said he actually liked Kennedy, but he probably understood what he would be later on. I don't guess, I don't guess he considered it all the way. I might tell you that I've sort of been captured by this story because everywhere I ever worked, Dallas News, Dallas Times Herald, Newsweek Magazine, 2020, Washington Times, everywhere, 
every new conspiracy theory that came out, I had to run after it, which led me to some interesting people. I remember one guy from West Texas who wanted to be somebody said his dad killed Kennedy. And I thought, my gosh, that's something. He said, well, I want to write a book, and I need to talk to you. I, went, I met him at the Melrose Hotel. We talked. And I checked, and his dad it was a Dallas cop, which made it even more, more sensible, you know. <laughs> anyway, I found out his daddy was 20 miles out of town serving a warrant that day, wasn't even in Dallas. Then came along the, the Jim Garrison probe in New Orleans, where Garrison for two years kept coming up with new witnesses, and new things. This is where some of the people got hurt very badly, innocent of nothing. He, he charged Clay Shaw with being involved, actually being a shooter. We found out that Clay Shaw actually was on a train at the time, almost, well, he was going to San Francisco, and he was almost there. And Mark Lane came out with the first conspiracy book. Mark Lane spent only four days in Dallas. That was the extent of his investigation. And the only thing in there, I helped him, and I, I hate to admit it, but he came to me, he was a lawyer from New York, and he said, I think Oswald deserves a right to be represented, and I'm going to represent him. He was a lawyer. And I said, well, I agree with you. Yeah, that's, that's good. He said, could I come to your house and talk to you? Now, this was in early January of 64. Like a fool, I sat with him for a couple hours, and he'd tell me, well, this is where the shots came from, this is where they ran, and this car did this. And, and I said, no, I, I kept saying, no, that isn't right. And he said, well, how do you know? And he kept saying, how do you know so much? And he didn't believe me. So I said, excuse me, man. I went to the other room, and I brought back a sheaf of papers. I had 70 to 80 witnesses' statements, people who had been interviewed that day as to where they were, what they saw, what they heard, and no other newsman had him at that time. And he said, my God, he said, this, this is wonderful. He said, he said this will make my case. And I said, that's why I'm telling you you're wrong about most of this. He said, could I borrow these? I, I'll go back to New York and I'll, I'll, I'll sue somebody. And I was a fool. I said, of course, we didn't have Xerox machines on every corner at that time. So I let him take all these things that nobody else had because he said he was going to be a lawyer for his mother, Oswald's mother. I didn't hear from him. He said he'd have him back in a week. I didn't hear from him for a month. One day I get a telephone call from a very famous historian in, in London and he said, Hugh Ainsworth, I say, I just want to congratulate you on stealing all the materials from the Dallas police. And I said, look, sir, I didn't steal those. How do you know about these? Oh, he said, Mark Lane's here. He's, he's starting Who Killed Kennedy Committees, and we've raised a lot of money. And I said, look, I did not steal anything from anywhere. I lent him, him those things. So over the years, he and I had not been real good friends. That was the first big conspiracy theorist, and he made millions out of four days in Dallas. One thing that always stands out, Oswald, Ruby, and, and all these wannabes, they just want to be noticed. You're a small town reporter, or not a reporter, anybody. You come up with a new theory newspaper covers it, maybe the radio and television, suddenly you are somebody. And that's what, that's what drives a lot of these people. I've seen it so many times. I, I've had people confess to me. And I've had to run down every one of them, no matter where I worked. There was a lady in a Mexican jail told Jim Garrison, who turned it over to me, 
said uh, he saw, she saw Lyndon Johnson pass money to Oswald in a Mexican border town. Well, I had to run and check it out. Finds out she's been in the Mexican prison for two months before that and during that period of time. There was a man in San Francisco that Garrison liked as one of his main witnesses for a while. Found out that he was in a mental institution. He wrote easily, he was very legible writing, but he hadn't been he hadn't seen daylight for months. And it just goes on and on. There were so many of these. Uh, it, it got awfully tiresome. And Garrison got tired of me because I wrote in Newsweek that he was making it all up. I was the first reporter to report that it was a fake and that Clay Shaw was guilty of nothing except being there in New Orleans. The funny thing about that trial, I found out who, who their witnesses were and they had a one witness that really made a good point for Garrison. He was a New Yorker. We found out later he'd sued the New York Police Department a hundred different times. Some of them were still pending. And his complaint was that they were zapping him sterile. And this guy, you wouldn't, you wouldn't believe, he got up on the stand and, and, and the Shaw defense said they, they'd found out, I helped him find out some of the stuff, that he fingerprinted his own daughter when he came to Texas to see her. And uh, they asked him on the stand, do you fingerprint your daughter? He said, I do indeed. You never know who they are. This was the type of witness that Garrison had. Garrison had another witness that still makes me sick. There was a Kansas, Kansas teacher in a medical school, and I won't name which school. An old lady worked for the, for the school she died, and he was a conspiracy theorist, and he wanted to prove that the shots didn't happen, as everyone said they did. So this woman had no family. He stole that body, took it out, and propped it up, and they shot it three times with a man like her, Kirkano. He was one of Garrison's main witnesses. Horrible. And I saw this type of thing over and over, people's lives ruined. You know, the, the public officials in Dallas, partly to blame too. Well, public officials all over. There was all kinds of fake news, you might say. I remember District Attorney Henry Wade was a good man. District Attorney of Dallas, many, many years. He was asked how Oswald got from the depository building over to Oak Cliff to his apartment and on to kill the police officer. And uh, he said, well, he just ran out the door and got a cab and, and, and went to Oak Cliff. And then, of course, 10, 20 press people were there. And they said, well, who's the cab driver? Who's the cab driver? And he said, Daryl Click. Well, a few hours later, we found out that there'd never been a cab driver in all of Texas named Darrell Click. And I asked a DA later, I said, Henry, how did you come up with that? He said, I don't know. It just came into my mind. <laughs> when they brought the, the man liquor Kirkano out, you've seen pictures, the man holding it above his head. Somebody said, and I'm not sure who it was, one of the officers of the county, said, hey, that's a Mauser. Well, all the press was there. He was on the wire minutes later, and suddenly then, an hour later, we examined it, it's a Manlinger Kirkano. Even J. Edgar Hoover, who was advising LBJ that, that weekend, he, he, he was asked, he asked, I guess LBJ asked him, how did he get to Cliff? How did he kill the cop? How did he all this? And J. Edgar Hoover, the head who should have known, said, well, he came out the door, and he ran into this policeman, and he shot him, 
And then he ran in the cat, got a taxi cab, and went to Oak Cliff. Well, that wasn't correct. And you can still hear that on tape on the internet. On the fifth floor of that building where we found the gun and the wrapping paper in which the gun was uh, wrapped, has been wrapped, and upon which we find the full fingerprints of this man Oswald, uh, we, uh, on that floor, we found the three empty shells that had been fired and one shell that had not been fired. In other words, there were four shells, four shells apparently. And he had, he had fired three, but didn't fire the fourth one. He then threw the gun aside and came down and at the, at the entrance of the building, he was stopped by a police officer and some, uh, work, some manager in the building told the police officer, well, he's all right, he works for you, he can, uh, you needn't hold him. So they let him go. That's how he got out. Mm. And then he got on a bus. The bus driver has identified him and went out to his home and uh, got hold of a jacket that he bought it for some purpose and came back downtown, walking downtown, and uh, the uh, police officer who was killed stopped him, uh, not knowing who he was and not uh, knowing wh whether he was the man, but they were uh, just on suspicion, and he fired, of course, and killed the police officer. Then he walked down, uh, walked you, you can prove that. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, we can prove that. Then he walked about another uh, another two blocks and went to the theater. And the woman at the theater window selling the ticket, she was so suspicious uh, of the way he was acting. And she said he was carrying a gun. He had a revolver at that time which he, with which he had killed the police officer. Uh, the, he went into the theater and then she notified the police. And the police and our man down there went in there and uh, located this particular man. We had quite a struggle with him. He fought like a regular lion, and he had to be subdued, of course, and his brother was then brought out, of course, taken to the police uh, headquarters. The way Oswald came out the front door, he walked four blocks up Elm Street. He got on a city bus. That bus would have taken him down there, past the depository, and on to Oak Cliff, where his rooming house was. But he even got a transfer. And that's how I found out about how the, the trip and the timing and all. Because when he was captured, he still had that bus transfer. So I got it with a real good reporter named Larry Grove, and he and I worked together, and we, five days later, came up with the cab driver, the bus driver, his whole route, minute by minute. Probably one of the best reporting jobs we had done. Those of us that have written fact in the story often are not very popular. In fact, if you go on the internet, you'll find that Everyone thinks I'm a CIA agent. My son came up to me after looking through some of the stuff and said, well, Daddy, uh, you, did they give you a, pen, a pension when you retired? <laughs> and, 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 and three years ago, I was at a book fest in, in Austin. And a big old fellow came out of the crowd and said, I can prove you're CIA. We all know it. And I said, well, let me let me explain something to you. And the, the, the coordinator said, well, you know, sit down, you can't ask. I said, no, let me, let me deal with that. <laughs> and I told him, I said, look, in 1962, I wanted to go to Cuba. 
I knew that Castro was in charge, and at first he was a bright light. Everybody liked him. And then he'd become a communist, and we all distrusted him. And I wanted to go see what Cuba, what was going on. So I went to the editor of the Dallas News and talked him into it. And uh, you couldn't deal with the Cuban government then because we were not together. You had to go through the Czechoslovakian embassy. So I tried to get a visa to go to Cuba, and I had to fill out all kinds of papers with the Czech embassy. Never heard a word. Six months, eight months, I get a call. And this guy said, uh, this is John Smith with the, F with the CIA, and you're going to Cuba. And I said, well, what? How do, how do, I don't understand. How do you know? He said, well, I just know. And now, let me tell you, when you get there, you're going to take cameras and stuff. And you, I want you to take pictures. I said, wait, wait. I'm a good American, and when I come back, I'll share everything I know, see, or photograph but I'm not going under the aegis of the CIA. He said, well, all right. Didn't ever hear from him. Didn't know that they had an office in Dallas, really. It was an unmarked place in the federal building. Anyway, the conspiracy, he wrote to his boss. Thanks. Thanks for that. Ainsworth going to Cuba, and he's going to help us. So now all the conspiracy guys that hate me so you see, that's proof he, he was CIA. But it gets, it gets a little old, that sort of thing. Jim Garrison uh, went to trial against Clay Shaw, and Clay Shaw, after two years of publicity, and all this new proof of Kennedy conspiracy, there was only one ballot, came in and Shaw was innocent, in less than one hour. And the <laughs> foreman of the jury told me that day, we'd have been in a lot sooner, but a lot of people had to go to the bathroom. But Garrison got tired of me, and he tried to have me beaten up once. I was staying at the Monteleone Hotel, fortunately, because the head of security there was a good friend of mine. and. Uh, he got a tip that these two guys were coming to beat me up. So I changed hotels real fast. And later, Garrison bragged about it to me. But it's, it's, been, a, it's been a strange case. It's been a horrible case as you relived it tonight. But it uh, concerns me a lot because I see in today's political climate the same distrust, the same horror, the same fake news, and I don't know what the answer is. But it's, uh, for me, it's been a long journey. It's been hard sometimes, but I've tried to be as honest as I could. And uh, I'm sure out there you have some questions, so I'm losing my voice, but I can Sure, take a few questions. Yeah, thank you very much for being here tonight. I appreciate it. Um, I, I am not a conspiracy guy, and, and I think that Oswald certainly had something to do with it. But the thing that bothers me more than anything is not, um, is not understanding and appreciating the, the significance of all of the documentation that came out about uh, the way that he was killed. But then you factor in Ruby, and that's, that's something that I can't explain. I can't, I can't rationalize the part that he played in this, and that, that bothers me with regard to being able to put a lock on this thing. I understand totally. If you knew Jack Ruby, you knew that every time there was a fire, big raid of any kind or anything newsworthy, he would run to it, no matter where he was in his strip joint or on the street. And then he would go to the radio stations, say, I'm Jack Ruby, and I, I saw this and I did that. He did this constantly for years. And it, it was pretty natural 
that Ruby would be at the scene of anything, as you could imagine. Now, that morning is key. If you look at the timing and what he did that morning, he woke up about 8.30 that morning because he was interrupted with a telephone call from a stripper named Little Lynn in Fort Worth. Little Lynn was crying she needed 25 bucks to pay her rent, she told Ruby. Ruby said, all right, I'll go down to Western Union and I'll send it to you later today. Okay. Then he does his wash and he dries his clothes. Then he, <laughs> now the, the timing that we were told, he would be moved at 10 o'clock sharp. That was from the police chief, the city manager, and everybody else that you talked to. In fact, when I got up nine and found out they hadn't moved him, I knew they'd had threats. I said, I didn't eat, I didn't shave, I just ran to the, to the place. But anyway, what caused them not to move him at 10 was a postal inspector wanted to interview him one more time. And that's why it was 11 something when he was moved. But Ruby takes his time, he goes down to Western Union. Now by then it's, you know, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. He doesn't know whether he's moved or not. I'm sure he does. Now at Western Union in those days, when you sent a, a money, they'd stamp a time on it and give you the receipt. When Ruby left the Western Union office, it was 11.13 that morning. Now as he goes out the front door there on Main Street, one block up is where they're backing a police car out to get Ruby in another car. He shot him at 11.17, four minutes after he got his thing stamped. Does that sound like a hired assassin to you? I think that makes a pretty good case. He'd have been there a little bit earlier than that, don't you think? Word around town was that they were going to try to shoot the shoot him as they transferred him from one jail to the other. And when I got up Sunday morning and found out about about nine o'clock, got up and he wasn't moved yet, I said, man, I gotta get down there. So I ran like mad for the city hall and police department. Got in there probably 15 minutes before Ruby appeared. And we're all fighting for a position and waiting for them to bring Oswald out and put him in a car and take him. Uh, I didn't see it because there were two huge cameras. In those days, the, the TV guys had huge, heavy cameras. And everybody would, by this time, this was Sunday morning, there must have been, I, I could have counted 20 different nations that sent newsmen here. And it was just a madhouse. Of course, they were knocking us all out of the way. So I didn't see it until about a minute later when I saw them pick him up and take him in to the uh, police department. Tell him about, tell him about uh, how Sheriff Decker wanted to do it in the middle of the night as opposed to... Bill Decker was sheriff for a long time and a good, good thinker and good man. He had a sort of a country boy attitude, but he said, I would have moved him in the middle of the night and nobody would ever seen him. <laughs> They'd find out he was there. And, and even... Jim Lavelle, the officer who was handcuffed to Oswald, told me he tried to get him to go out the front door. He said, all the presidents down in the basement, you go out the front door and get in the car and drive, nobody would know you're even going. There were a lot of ways to cure that problem, wasn't there? Well, I've got the microphone here. Um, what I was wondering is uh, recently when they asked, when they just released these new records, the person who's in charge of the archival committee um, for the assassination, he said they asked everybody on the House <coughs> Select Committee if they thought there uh, was a conspiracy. And they said that they all did, but it was a mafia conspiracy, but they could never prove it. Uh, do you know much about that? And that was the Minnesota judge who was in charge of that committee that said that. Well, I knew Jack Ruby. One time I came out of the Adolphus Hotel down the front steps on Commerce Street, 
and I saw a man running out of the Seagulls liquor store right across the street. And he was bleeding and he was screaming. And following him was Jack Ruby. Now I'd seen Ruby enough and seen what, what kind of guy he was. I disliked him tremendously. And the guy said, he hit me, he hit me. And I went over to the liquor store and talked to the owner. And he said, I don't know why. The guy tried to bump a quarter from Ruby and he picked up a fifth of whiskey, broke it over his head. This guy, he was a wannabe, but he was a mean son of a gun, too. Oh, I was just wondering, now why did you say that they took him out at the time they did instead of taking him out at night or sometime when uh, Jack Ruby is who I was talking about? I'm sorry, would you repeat that? Yeah. She wanted to know why they changed the time that Oswald was. Oh, I uh, know why. They were going to move him at 10. A postal inspector federal said I need to talk with him one more time my office wants to ask him can I interview him just for a few minutes and he did for an hour 10 minutes or whatever that was what, what the hold up was yes uh, I had a question uh, about your opinion um, on the uh, Secret Service on November 22nd whether, in your opinion, um, they, if they were on top of their game, they could have prevented the assassination. Uh, I think it's a well-known fact that uh, testimony before the Warren Commission that uh, they were out part partying in Fort Worth till two or three o'clock in the morning. And uh, I don't know if, you know, if uh, how, how you do or people here, but if, if you're out that late, I don't know how you can be on the top of your game if you're a security guy. And of course, you know, they violated so many rules of uh, security, you know, with an open car and parade route downtown, high buildings. But uh, I'm just curious, you know, I, I think uh, the Secret Service, obviously, I, I don't know, they made a lot of reforms uh, after November 22nd, 63. But uh, I really feel that uh, that agency uh, let the American public down on that particular day. Well, the, I've heard that a good bit, and I think some legitimate concern because several agents were drinking beer over in Fort Worth till two or three o'clock. But none of the agents that were in the car behind or in the president's car or the other cars, the first four anyway, were in that group in Fort Worth. But uh, I agree with you, they shouldn't have been out that late anyway but I don't think that had anything to do with it. And Kennedy himself did not want them on the back of his car. Usually there were two agents on the rear and he asked specifically, he, he wanted to be closer to the people and he did not want them there. Questions, comments? Could you comment on the battle between the Dallas police and Robert Kennedy on the body of the president uh, when they wanted to take him out of, get him back to Washington, and the Dallas police wanted to conduct their murder investigation. The, could you comment on that and about uh, the effect that might have had on the investigation? Well, I think it had a tremendous effect on the investigation because rightfully and lawfully, he's, the autopsy should have been in Dallas. And the Dallas people tried to get the body to do that. Had that happened, we wouldn't have all these theories about the caskets being changed and, and all the people that saw the body and saw different wounds and all that. They, they broke the law, the Secret Service did, by just taking the body. No doubt about it. And it's sad because the man who would have done the autopsy had done hundreds of autopsies on what I call the Saturday night, you know, all the killings that came in through Parkland Hospital. He did all those <coughs> autopsies, so that's it's sad. Questions, comments, protest? I was going to make a comment uh, regarding about your investigation over your career is has your name been slandered by other authors who wrote books? Yeah, yes, it, I'd say so. 
people like Mark Lane, people like Oliver Stone, people, a lot of them just hate me. Never met me, but hate me. And they, they think I'm an agent of some kind. And there's some things they can't deny because I broke a lot of the main stories to begin with. I know that uh, two or three of them have made a great effort to, to indicate that I stole the Russian diary by having sex with Marina Oswald. That, that didn't please my wife very much. But <laughs> I, she says, you keep denying it. <laughs> Do you think that he was fired up on from the uh, book depository? I do think the three shots came from the depository. And I know there are all kinds of people that think shots came from the grassy knoll through the windshield. But let me tell you one thing for sure. There was a, there was a break in the windshield of that car, but I felt it myself, and it was on the inside, not the outside. Let me tell you another garrison story that I thought was funny. One time Jim said, well, I, I just found out I have a good source. I found out that uh, the, the, the real shooter fired from the uh, sewer there, that, that opening in the sewer. And I'd been through about 15 different explanations that Jim had come up with. And I said, well, Jim, do you don't understand I made this up? That, that sewer is only 14 inches in diameter wide. And Garrison looked at me and he, as I was crazy, said, well, there's some awfully small men in America and they're madder than hell. <laughs> yes, in your opinion, um, if the president had not been assassinated, do you believe the Vietnam War would have unfolded the way that it did under Johnson? Well, I'm not a historian, and I have no facts that you don't have, but it seems to me that uh, Lyndon bought into it far too long. Who knows what would have happened? I think it would have been a different outcome had we stopped before we did. What are your thoughts on the magic bullet theory? Well, I, I think there were three shots. I heard them. Now, I have to admit to you, I've heard that at that day, one guy told me he heard 11 shots. But the magic, I have not studied the magic bullet, but there is no other evidence of anyone else shooting or any other shots other than those three. So I just don't know. Did you ever interview uh, Governor Connolly or President Johnson after the assassination, uh, in regards to the assassination, and what were the results of those interviews? I interviewed Connolly afterwards, yes. And uh, there was a story that came out that, in fact, there's a new book about it, that uh, he was really trying to kill Connolly because he got a bad discharge out of the Marines. Well. Connolly was Secretary of the Navy just before that. And in charge, you know, he would have been in charge of that discharge or whatever. But uh, Connolly was already, has already re resigned and was gone. So I don't think he was after Connolly. And the people have told me, you know, Connolly walked to lunch every day in Austin and somebody could have killed him very easy with all the groups of people around him, you know. So I don't think he was after Carly, no. That was an interesting time. I had an interview with Lyndon Johnson. This was before. This was during the Cuban Missile Crisis, 1962. And I had just been in Cuba and just come back. I was with the Dallas News and I talked them into going down and seeing See, when Castro came in, he was somewhat of a hero to us. We thought, that's, you know, that's, that's good. That's good replacement for a long-time president that was bad for the Cubans. But by, by then, he had already decided he was a communist, and we didn't like him anymore. So I wanted to see what was going on in Cuba, and the news told me I could go. So 
I was just just gotten back when the Cuban Missile Crisis happened. Lyndon Johnson at that time was being sort of mistreated by the Kennedys. They were not sharing anything with him. They were there was talk that he was going to be replaced in '64 in the election. So he was keeping tabs and keeping close contact with all the Texas newspapers, the main ones, you know, Fort Worth, Houston, Austin, Dallas. So he calls Jack Kruger at the Dallas News and says, hey, I see your Ainsworth, your reporter's down there in Cuba. And Jack, Jack told him, well, no, he's back. He's been back a couple of days. And he said, well, tell him to come on up here. Now, this was the Thursday just before the crisis broke. Nobody knew what the Security Council had done. We were dealing with Khrushchev, who seemed hardline and then sort of eased up a little bit. Anyway, they sent me up. I stayed in a hotel for a couple of days till everything was okay. And Lyndon said, well, come on out. So I go out to the Johnson's. And uh, during the missile crisis, all these people were up day and night. It was really a crucial time. We came awfully close to nuclear war, I think. Anyway, he's in his pajamas. He says, come on up, upstairs. So I go up to his bedroom. He gets back in bed. Now, they just moved in. I'm not sure the Navy facility where he lived at that time, where they lived. But the only, there was only one chair, and it was filled with papers and shoes. They just moved in. So I had to sit on the bottom of the bed. I was sitting here and Lyndon's up here. And it was a good interview because he shared with me the Khrushchev the latest note, where the first one had been pretty harsh, the second one was conciliatory and enabled them to deal with Khrushchev. Anyway, I, I, I just thought it was a strange situation. And Lyndon being Lyndon, he had his pajamas on, and you know how men in pajamas sometimes reveal more than they want to. <laughs> and he got up to go to the restroom, and there wasn't any, about that much space between where I was and where he walked by. And I thought, this is the strangest damn interview. <laughs> <laughs> Let me get somebody new. Thank you. I understand that when Oswald was first arrested, he said something like, oh, I didn't kill anybody, and I'm a patsy. And I was just wondering what your comments were on that. But um, I also wonder what, if anything, he may have said while he was in custody for those few days, or as you said, he was questioned by this postal inspector. Are, are there any transcripts or information? Is there any information available about what Os what else Oswald might have said? Well, we don't know exactly everything that he said, no. And uh, the Dallas police, police did not have a tape recorder. They did not. They were turned down when Captain Fritz tried to buy one. So we really don't know what all was said. And uh, I know that from some of the officers that were in and out in that day, said that he denied everything. Said he was somewhere else. Said he had nothing to do with it. Even denied being a, uh, being in Russia. So I really don't know. Maybe, maybe there's some of that still embargoed. I don't know. But I know he did not confess. Because Jim Lavelle, the guy that was handcuffed to him, I've been his friend for 50 years, and he would have told me if he said anything worthwhile. Hugh, again, I want to thank you for uh, for coming tonight and uh, appreciate all the work you've done over 50 years to uh, clarify this exceedingly complex situation. Um, it's interesting that the Dallas police uh, were not able to connect the dots on uh, Ty and Oswald to uh, the assassination attempt uh, for General Walker, I believe, was that in May of 63? Uh, 
Um, but um, had they done that, you know, maybe history would be different. Um, and the other thing is, it, it sounds like Oswald wanted to be caught by not buying a ticket. Uh, you know, he's a very smart guy to plan the assassination, uh, but obviously he didn't do a very good job in uh, planning his escape. Uh, you know, he could have got on a Greyhound bus down there and headed to Mexico. You know, that, that might have uh, uh, been a route for him. But, uh, you know, it sounds to me like, you know, he, uh, under a lot of stress, obviously, but uh, and under, under pressure like that, we all would make mistakes, I think. But uh, uh, very, very uh, interesting psychological uh, study. Thank you. Thank you very much. I agree with you. He didn't have it all planned out. <laughs> One last question. Have you read either of the books about uh, conspiracy theory by Beverly Oliver, who has been at this venue before, and also the book Mortal Error by uh, Manager? Have you read either of those books? I'm familiar with Solvers, yes. The other one I have not read. Thank you, Hugh Ainsworth. <laughs>